Happy Easter. What a joyful day in the life of the church, not just this church, but uh, all of our brothers and sisters around the world who are uh, rejoicing this, this day and, and just remembering not just the sacrifice, but also the power of God that was displayed on that Resurrection Sunday and, and seeing the, uh, the Lord of all creation come out of the tomb and, and know that the promises are fulfilled. Um, when I think about Easter, there's a lot of things that I, I certainly do think about and many of the things that we've, we've already talked about, and whether it be uh, the angels rolling the stone away, the, uh, the empty tomb, the shroud, uh, simply, simply laying there. But uh, for me, one of the things that I, I think about every single year is just the, the change in emotion uh, that takes place that first Easter morning where you have had a couple of days of unspeakable sorrow that all of a sudden give, give way to unspeakable joy. And just the, in a matter of a, of a few instances, that the, the change of the people that, uh, that we're living in that time. And, and I hope today as we uh, continue in our time of worship, as we open up the Word of God and we read it and uh, we exposit it and we see what, uh, what the Lord is trying to tell us today through His Word, I hope that 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 sense of joy can continue because this certainly is a, a day of, of thanksgiving and rejoicing and just enjoying what the Lord has done for us. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. We're going to be starting in verse 1, and as you uh, make your way there, I will just say that it is not an overstatement to say that without the empty tomb, without that first uh, Easter Sunday, our faith really doesn't have any legs to stand on. It is the, the fact that the tomb is empty, is the fact that the Lord was resurrected, uh, that we can have confidence and we can have faith and we can have uh, this, this, this entire worldview that we have of moving forward in the, the sovereignty and the plan and the purpose of God. And, and so this really is the, uh, the pinnacle of celebration within the life of the church. And I think we're going to see that here in Matthew chapter 28 as we read through this portion of God's Word. And starting with verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. And so they departed quickly from the tomb and with, with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. May God bless that piece of his word for us here this morning. If you look in all four of the Gospels, they are going to have a resurrection account. It is, in fact, the, the most significant event in all of human history, and so you would expect all four Gospels to have an account of the resurrection, and they do. And while they, they tend to differ in, in certain small details, uh, Pastor Ryan touched on this this morning during our, our sunrise service, there is incredible continuity within the Gospels and within the, the Gospel accounts of the resurrection. And one of these, uh, these items of continuity is that right away it mentions a group of women who were the ones that found the tomb empty. And for us, this may sound like a, a small detail, but for uh, the people of the first century and for our understanding of the Gospels and the understanding of Easter morning and of the resurrection and of the Christian faith, this is an incredibly important detail that the, the gospel writers, all four, would record that it was a group of women who found the tomb empty. 
This is actually why many scholars of the New Testament point to the fact that they did record women finding the tomb empty, that we can have a great deal of confidence and trust in the Bible. Because in the first century, women could not testify in court. Uh, they uh, were not, were often were not trusted uh, just at their word uh, without a, having some man to mansplain everything to them uh, before they even knew what mansplaining was. And so for all of the gospel writers to, to have these women find the tomb empty, and not, for instance, Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus or some of these other important men that Jesus had encountered within his life, it shows that, that they don't care about what it looks like. They care what actually happened, what occurred there in the first century on this first Easter morning. And if I could, I'd like to say a, a quick word from a modern context and just say the church would not be able to survive today without the faithfulness of our women, without the faithfulness of those who serve in so many different roles within the church and, and just within the life of First Baptist Church. If you, if you were here yesterday, you saw just the, the amount of work that it, it took to put something like that together and the the numbers of, of ladies and, I mean, gentlemen were there too, don't get me wrong, but there just the faithfulness of, of the women within the church. And, and within the church today, you have a, almost an epidemic of, of men staying home and not being involved in the work of the church. And, and I personally blame John Walton. Uh, you remember the Waltons TV show? You remember that? I mean, just a good, wholesome TV show, right? You Gen Zers, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But it was, a, it, was a, it was a TV show. It's just a good, wholesome Christian family. But Dad didn't go to church with the rest of the family. Do y'all remember that? He would always stay home and they would come back because, you know, it was, it was what the women did and the children and, and maybe the young men. But, but the church desperately needs men. And I'm just thankful that, that until we step up to the plate, until we do the, the work that the Lord has, has called us to do, so, uh, sovereignly ordained us to do, that we have faithful women. And even in the first century, you see as the disciples are scared and worried and hiding away in their, in their rooms, you know, fearing that, that what happened to Jesus might happen to them, here are the women going to the tomb in front of everybody to prepare the, to, to anoint the body with the spices and the ointments and the things that, that they had prepared on the day of preparation observing the Sabbath, not going until the, the first day of the week. In their moment of greatest sorrow, these ladies persevere in the faith. And is it a great example for us to follow? It's an example for us to follow in the sense that, that we would hope that we would have the same faith response in our lives. It's the first lesson that we learned from the empty tomb, that before they even realize that the tomb is empty, their active faith continues in the midst of sorrow. Not just when times are good. Not just after the resurrection. But we see these ladies active participants in their faith during their deepest time of sorrow. We are so far removed from the crucifixion and the resurrection 2,000 plus years that it is easy for us to simply focus on the joy that was experienced by the people. And that certainly is the, the emphasis of the passage and certainly the emphasis of our day. But before the time of joy, there was a time of true heartache within the followers of Christ for the people who were closest to him. And it would be easy for them to give up and wallow and pity and self-doubt. But instead they continued. They went to the tomb faithfully not knowing what they would find. I like Mark's account. If you look at Mark's account of the, of the, the resurrection, as the women are going to the, to the tomb, they're asking themselves, how are we going to roll this stone away? You know, how are we going to, to get into the tomb to anoint the body? They didn't know. They were just carrying on in faith. They had no idea that, that the stone was already going to be rolled away. They didn't have the answers, but they had faith. Even when they had no joy on this day yet, they had faith. Faith that during even the most heartbreaking, most difficult of times in their lives, God was going to see them and work through them and be with them and comfort them. John chapter 16, 
Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. They had heard these words, but they didn't know the, the way in which it was going to happen yet. They didn't know it was going to happen with a, with a moment of intense heartache and sorrow, followed by just the most intense joy that they could possibly experience. It is a promise that we, even today, will all have trouble. Maybe even on Easter Sunday. We do not know what is going to happen as we leave these, these walls here today. But even the, the moments of our greatest heartache, Christ has overcome the world. And because he has overcome the world, we can carry on today. But the way in which we carry on is also depicted in these Gospels. And this is where I actually really want to get into the text it's seen in two primary ways. And the first of these ways, the first response that we see by both believers and non-believers, faithful and unfaithful, is found in verses 2 through 4. Look at this with me again. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. This is the miraculous. This is the supernatural. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him... The guards trembled and became like dead men. There is fear. Fear comes over the people. And if you look carefully, it wasn't just the guards. It wasn't just the unbelievers who experienced this fear. It was also the women, the faithful, those who, even at this point in time, more faithful than the apostles, than the men. And the angel who rose the stone away looks at the women and says in verse 5, Don't be afraid. Why did he have to say this? Because they were afraid. We can, we can deduce that. It's, it's not a stretch. This is similar to Jesus' birth. Luke chapter 2, as the angels appear to the shepherds watching over their flocks. And they have to say, Fear not. I bring you good news of great joy. Because they were afraid. You also see this with Moses in the Sinai account of the burning bush. Fear grips Moses, and he has to be reassured by God that he is safe. My favorite and probably the most similar to this account is when Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos, and John records what we now have as the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, it says, and again, this is John. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. So, Exactly the same reaction that the soldiers at the tomb have. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. John, the faithful apostle, the apostle that Jesus loved, even after the resurrection, even after the years of ministry, he once again finds himself in the presence of Jesus, and what does he do? He falls on the ground as if he were dead. He is so afraid. What does this show us? It shows us on this Easter morning where there is such great joy and there is such great thankfulness. It shows us that an encounter with God still invokes a fearful response and that God's presence is a fearful force. Once again, in each of the gospel accounts, we see the response of fear grip the people who find themselves in the presence of God. Or in the presence of God's messengers, as it were. It doesn't have to be Jesus or the Father, but the authority of God, which is given in the, the messenger to deliver the word of God, it invokes a fear response. There is not a single instance in any of the Gospels where the people find the tomb empty and they are immediately overjoyed when they see the angels. Every single time their immediate response is fear and they take a step back. And they wonder, what is going on here? Am I going to be okay? The, the Gospels are clear on this. And we should make sure that we are equally as clear in our view of God. In the way in which we encounter the presence of God. There's a common misconception about our relationship with Christ Jesus and with the Father. And this is a cozy, pal-around type of relationship. And it's even found in modern Christian marketing. There's a t-shirt going around that says, Jesus is my homeboy. And if you have one of these, you might want to slouch down because I'm about to make fun of you. Okay? Because this is, this is what the, the intention of this is to, 
is to widen the tent of Christianity. It's to, it's to make it you know, more palatable and accepting and all that. And, and we don't want to use, lose the, the idea that Jesus does choose to be our friend and, and is our friend and, and came to the world as a friend. But Jesus is not our homeboy. Jesus is God. He is a creator of heaven and earth. He is creator of everything that there is. We can think of him as, as friend and savior and all these things, but first and foremost, he is God. And we have to think of him that way. When, when you and I one day, hopefully many years from now, meet God face to face, and we stand face to face with Christ, the first reaction is going to be to fall at his feet. I promise you, it's going to be to fall at his feet in worship. No matter what perception we have of how we're going to, to behave and act whenever we, we meet God, we're not going to, to walk up and have some secret handshake. I don't even know what this is. Gang sign Jesus or something. I don't know what that is. We're going to fall at his feet and worship him. We sang how great thou art this morning. And the last verse of how great thou art in the sunrise service is, then I shall bow in humble adoration and proclaim my God how great thou art. That's the reaction. That's what we see biblically anytime anyone encounters God. And so with our, our day of great joy and day, day of great thanksgiving, it's in our worship, our humble adoration, knowing that He is God and we are not. And that is the only acceptable response to the presence of God. Fall at His feet and worship. And thankfully, our God is God who lifts us up off the ground. While every reaction to Jesus comes with fear and the utmost respect and reverence, whether it is in the Gospels or anywhere else in the Bible, it is followed by a simple command, do not be afraid. Verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. So do not be afraid. And then also, look at verse 8, the actual encounter with Jesus. They departed quickly from the tomb for fear, with fear and great joy, so they're still afraid. They ran to tell his disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. The only acceptable response. But then what does Jesus do? He said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So the first thing is that there is still fear. And we clearly see that there is fear and reverence for the risen Savior. But he tells them, do not be afraid. So while God's presence is a fearful force, God's love is a calming peace to every single one of us. And that's how it should be if we are in the, the presence of a, a holy and just and, and, yes, a terrible God, but also a loving, merciful, gracious God. He will pick us up off the ground and say, do not be afraid, and his love will be a calming peace. I remember when Sawyer was very, very young. He was probably, he was walking, so he was, he was older than one, but he was very, very young. We went to Stephanie's grandmother's for uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving or, or something like that, and we got out of the car, and, and she's got these yappy dogs. I don't even know what they were. Uh, probably several different breeds of something. And uh, so they're just, they're just running around yapping at the wheels of the, the car, and, and we get out, and so like I said, Sawyer's, very, very young. He's one, and he sees these little dogs, and, and he's, you know, they're running around, and he's laughing and all this sort of stuff, and then we go into the house, and when we walk into the house, there's another dog, but it's not a little yappy dog. It's a big black lab, is what it was, and immediately, he stops smiling, and he turns around, and he lifts his arms up, and he starts crying, and I grab him, and I pick him up, because he never seen a dog that big before, the little yappy ones, he's still bigger than them, that's fine. But here's something that he doesn't recognize. It's not, it's not like the others, and there's, a, and there's a fear response. And so what does he do? He turns, and he looks to Daddy, and he 
he makes the, the only noise he knows to make whenever he's in, in fear or, or discomfort, and he reaches his hands up. And so I pick him up, but after I pick him up, and I'm holding him there, and now he's, he's very high, he's above the dog, he looks down, and he sees that everything's fine, we bend down and pet him a little bit, he starts laughing again, right? Because then he knows everything's okay. We're going we're gonna to face a lot of things in our life. I know that many of you have already faced things that, that we don't even want to, uh, want to imagine. And we, it is easy for us to feel overwhelmed. And yes, it is easy even for the people of God to feel fearful about what this, this world is going to bring and what is going to happen in the future. But we are, when we are close to the presence of God and the love of God, and he lifts us up off the ground and says, Do not be afraid. We see with a, a different perspective. We see with a, a godly perspective, not like a, a secular, worldly perspective. When we know that no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Because our Lord and our Savior is holding us and keeping us close to Him. And adults, we need to, to exercise the same kind of protection. We need to have the same kind of protection. We need to protect our children, but we also need to realize that that the only calming peace that we can truly find in life is found in heaven. It's found from our, our Lord and Savior. There's, there's nothing else that we can seek after, whether it is you know, money or some ideology, uh, some political solution or whatever it may be. The only solution for the, the sin and the violence and the conflict and all the terrible things that we have here on this earth, the only solution is our God in heaven. And that's who we look to. The world doesn't understand this. They don't understand the kind of hope that we, that we have, the, the kind of trust that we have that the Lord is going to pick us off, off the ground and say, do not be afraid because I'm with you. They don't understand that. We have that kind of hope because of the empty tomb, but they don't believe in the empty tomb. And so they're left by themselves. But for us, we know that there was once a body in there, and that body came out. And it came out for our benefit. You know, there is, there is no... There's no physical restriction that holds the Lord our God anywhere in place. He walked on the water in a, in a thunderstorm, for goodness sake. He could have come out of the tomb any time he wanted, any way that he wanted. But he opened it up so that we could see in. And we could know he's not there anymore. The Apostle Paul de describes the peace of God in this way. Philippians chapter 4, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. And what he's talking about here is secular understanding. The reason that, that people who, who don't hold to the fact that the Lord is going to lift you up and say, don't be afraid. They can't understand. So he suppresses all worldly understanding. He will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It all comes back to the empty tomb. It all comes back to the fact that that promise is fulfilled. We have salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know that that is going to allow us to come into the family of God because of the power of God that was displayed on Easter morning. The fearful power of God that causes everybody around it to fall on the ground, faithful, unfaithful alike. The comfort that we have as believers, the hope that we have as believers is found in the resurrection. And I know that life does not always make the peace of Christ easy. The fact that we live in a world of sin changes everything. There are health struggles, financial struggles, struggles with people. There are spiritual warf warfare against the church. But when we can focus our attention on the love of God, the love that, that picks us up off the ground and says, do not be afraid, then we can find peace. And not just peace, but also purpose and an opportunity, opportunity to serve with meaning. Not just to exist, but to serve with meaning. The resurrection of Christ is purposely connected to the great commission of Christ. That's found in verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted this is going to happen. No matter, no matter how much hope, no matter how much trust, no matter how much the church can do, no matter how in line with the will of God we find ourselves, there will be some who doubt. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Dr. Duke, when he was here, he described the Great Commission as our marching orders. These were the last instructions that the Lord Jesus left with the church. Just like a general leaves orders with soldiers, Jesus leaves us this command, these instructions to go to all nations, or as you are going to all nations. And Jesus left us with these orders after the resurrection. We've got this great event in human history. We've got the joy and the happiness that the Lord is not dead, that sin and death and the grave, that nothing can, can hold him back, nothing can separate us from the love and the power of God. It is the height of encouragement. But what does that encouragement inspire us to do? Think about this on, on Easter morning when we've got, you know, everybody's got so, much, so many plans. You know, they're, they're looking at their watch right now and saying, I've got to get home and make lunch and, and all these different things. And we do too. You know, that's, I'm purposely not looking at my wife. You know, I'm looking out with you guys. But what does that encouragement inspire us to do? Jesus explains to us our next steps, and it is to recognize that Christ's empty tomb is our abundant opportunity. One of the things that, that helps me understand the opportunity that we have as a church is whenever I, I come in here on Sunday morning, I think about all the things that we have to do, and I think about all the things that we, we're, we're going to need to organize in order to make this this church service runs smoothly, but, but I also think about my own posture. How am I walking into this church on Sunday morning? What is, my, what is my mindset like as I come in? Am I thinking about all of the, the difficulties of the past week? Am I thinking about who, who might come and talk to me? What, what questions might they ask? How am I going to handle any problem that, that creeps up? How am I going to handle the text? How am I going to to exposit the text? Am I going to, to hit a home run? Am I going to lay an egg? Because it happens sometimes. You know, all of that is, is, is getting yourself, I, I try and get myself in the, the right mindset and, and to come in with the right posture and all of that happens before I even step foot in the, the church building. Am I going to, to faithfully prepare during the week and then when I get here, I'm just going to surrender it over to God? You know, whatever, Lord, whatever you sovereignly would have planned for this service. Get me out of the way of it. Let it, let it happen. And while this is vitally important for, for ministers and for pastors and those who, those who, who exposit and teach and, and counsel, it is equally important for, for the congregation. What is the, what is the posture in which we are coming into the church building? How did you come into the church building today? Are we thinking about all the things that we have to do after church? Or are we focusing on this is the day where we get to to single out the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what's happening to my right or to my left. It doesn't matter all the, the difficulties and the struggles that I've had this past week, anything that might happen when I walk through. What I'm going to do as I come into this building, I'm going to worship my Lord and Savior for what He has done. Because in the same way that I could get up here and, and just not do a, not do a good job and, and not expose it well and not... And not engage. And that posture doesn't mean that you, you're humorless or you're, you're, you don't try to in, engage the people. I, I mean, we certainly do, and sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail. But in the same way with, the, with, with you or any time you, you come before the Lord, in prayer, in your homes, what's the posture in which we go before God? Is it, is it humble adoration? Or are we also, is our mind going? Because sometimes I, sometimes I can see. I mean, you, you notice, you do this... You do this long enough, and you can look out, and you can see there is, there is something going on in, the, in, in somebody else's mind. It's not focused on the text, and it's not focused on the Lord. There's something going on in their life, and, and even, as, even as you're going through this, you can say a, a, a small little prayer for that person, whatever it is, because the world is distracting. It's distracting away from God. But I have found as we, as we prepare ourselves, before we even come into the building, we set our posture to, to worship that's our goal as we come in here, rather than all the other things. It really helps us to, to be more successful in that worship of God. And I think that you, you see that all throughout the resurrection accounts. They didn't know what to expect, but as soon as they, as soon as they found out 
their whole, their whole demeanor changed. The way in which they approached Christ changed. And I would pray that we, we had the same response today. One of the descriptions that, the only descriptions that we have of Jesus speaking in the book of Acts is found in Acts 1.8. Ryan read it for us earlier. It says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. I believe Acts 1.8 brings the story of Easter morning full circle. Active faith continuing, no matter what the circumstances of our life have or throw at us. I'm sure that many of you have heard this before, but the word witness is there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's the Greek word martus. It is where we get the English word martyr from. And so when, when you're looking at Acts 1, 8, I hope you read it as this. And you will be my martyrs in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. No matter what the Lord has, has called us to do, no matter what occupations we have, no matter the size of our families, the diversity and, and backgrounds, we have all been called to be Christ's witnesses in this community, in the extension of this community, to the entire world. And that's not just witnesses in the sense that we go and we talk about the gospel. It's just witnesses in the sense that whatever is, is called upon us, even to the point of death, even to the point of martyrdom, that's what Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is calling us to do. And I'm not sure how you came into this church building this morning. I don't know what's going on in, in your lives, the struggles that you've had or the successes that you've had. Sometimes success can be a, a real detriment to the church. We can think that everything that we touch turns to gold and, and there's no need for the Lord. But there is always a desperate need for the Lord. But no matter where you're, you're at in your faith journey right now, no matter what your commitment level may be, I want you to remember this, friends. We are Christ's witnesses. This church right here, this congregation, if you are sitting in here this morning, you are Christ's witnesses. We are the hands and feet that carry the good news. Nobody else is going to do it for you. It can't just be waiting on people to, to go to seminary and, and we need more pastors and all this sort of thing. We certainly do, but you are the hands and feet of Jesus. It's not my job. It's my responsibility as a follower of Christ. But it's not solely my job. You look at the story of Easter morning. You are the women at the tomb who have to go and tell the people about the joy you have experienced. You are the disciples on the hill who have the decision to doubt or to trust in the commission that Jesus has said. And so as we prepare to leave here this morning, let's leave here with a sense of joy at experiencing the resurrection, of knowing that our Savior lives. He's not in a tomb somewhere. But our Savior lives. But let's also leave here with a renewed sense of purpose, an abundant opportunity that has been afforded to each and every one of us as witnesses of the resurrection in this community of Reedsville and around the world. Would you commit to that this morning? And would you pray that with me right now?